Normally, when we have a conversation with patients about any cancer, it's quite unusual to tell a patient that they have cancer and then to follow up with a conversation that actually we don't need to treat it. And yet prostate cancer is one of those cancers where treatment is not always necessary. Right. How do we determine who does and who does not need treatment? Well, I always tell patients, the good news is that you have options. The bad news is that you have options. It's very confusing. You know, if you have an ear infection, we give you a moxil, we don't ask you, how would you like me to treat your ear infection? Prostate cancer is very different. And the reason it's different is that the vast majority of patients have an excellent outcome, and survival is described in decades. And so far, the studies really haven't shown a difference in outcomes 10 to 15 years later. So it's very important for patients to understand the pros and cons of each approach. Now let's talk about those patients that may be eligible for surveillance where we're not actually offering them definitive treatment, this whole concept of active surveillance. What does that mean? Who's eligible and who may not necessarily be eligible? Sure, so the nomenclature has changed. We used to call it watchful waiting, which is really watchful worrying. But active surveillance, the stress is on the word active. You know, these patients get a repeat PSA every six months and a repeat biopsy once a year. When I can, I try to convince the patients to get a repeat MRI as well, because if you have a good baseline MRI and you're looking for changes in the hypermetabolism, again, that will help direct the urologist where to do the repeat biopsy. The, the, the rationale behind that is that if you are going to follow a patient with their PSA every six months and a repeat biopsy once a year, even if there is to be disease progression, you'll catch it when you can still intervene and you won't you know, get to a point where you can't treat that patient anymore. The benefit is that you can avoid treatment with all the possible side effects. Now, often patients who are eligible for active surveillance, they have low grade, low risk, low volume disease. They're quite pleased to hear that. And they say, oh, great, you know, if I don't need to have surgery or radiation, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. And then the spouse chimes in and says, I'm not cool with that. You've got cancer, you need treatment. How do we deal with that where there's anxiety about being on surveillance? Some patients feel very strongly that they want treatment, even if it's not necessarily medically necessary. Sure, absolutely. And then often there's a conflict, isn't there, between sure. patient and partner. Right, it could be the partner or it could even be the patient. There's some interesting studies that have come out recently that even the men that choose to do active surveillance, after one or two years, they don't want to do it anymore because they're worrying about it or every arthritic ache, they're convinced they have metastatic prostate cancer. And some men just don't like the concept of the repeat biopsy. So really, it's individualized. A patient has to be comfortable with the concept of, I know I'm not dying from this. I'm going to allow to do this, you know, my urologist to repeat the biopsy, because that way I'll catch it if it starts progressing. But they really have to be comfortable and committing to that process. I always tell patients, don't leave here thinking I'm patting you on the back, you're going to be OK. You really have to follow up on it. I think when a patient buys into that commitment, I'm very comfortable with that. And also, when a patient signs on the dotted line for active surveillance, they're not committed to that. They can change their mind, oh, absolutely. of course. Absolutely, sure. Even if the PSA is stable and the prostate exam is stable, repeat biopsies are stable, occasionally patients just get to the point where they want to follow up. I just don't want them to leave and say, well, the doc said I'm fine, because unfortunately, we've all had patients who come in with a very aggressive cancer, and we look through the history, we realize that four or five years before, they had one focus of Gleason score six, where you know they probably should have been following up on that. Now, it's very hard to address all questions for all patients all of the time in a very short segment like this, but so many patients, the treatment that they get is determined by who they see first or who they see last or where they get referred to. How do you counsel a patient who said, well, you know, I went to see Dr. X and he's a surgeon and he recommended surgery and I went to see Dr. Y and he's a radiation oncologist and he says I need radiation and now I'm really confused as to what to do and they've almost got too much information and second, third and fourth opinions just add to the confusion. How do we guide patients as to what treatment path to, to choose? I think it's very important that patients see more than one physician. And it's often best to be managed by a multi-modality team. You want to have a urologist, perhaps a urologic surgeon, because not every urologist does the surgery, and then a radiation oncologist, and get a really good discussion. And if there's confusion, go see a medical oncologist as well. I mean, oftentimes you need a tiebreaker to determine right. that. Um, but I, in my practice, I try to really you know, lay it out. It's not my job to choose for the patient. These are all options, active surveillance, surgery and radiation are all options. And I would never tell a patient you're making a mistake. 
because there's never been a study that looked at the modalities and did a head-to-head -head comparison to prove right. that one is better than the other. So I think it's our job to really lay out the options, the pros and cons of each approach, and let the patient choose. And prostate cancer, thankfully, the patients do have time to do their homework. It's not that they need to make a decision within a week or two. Yeah, they do really have time, don't they, to Absolutely. look around, get second opinions, be comfortable that the treatment options that they're signing up for is really the right choice for them. Sure, I mean, typically if a patient has a biopsy, if they're gonna choose surgery, they've gotta wait about eight weeks anyway because there's some hemorrhage from the biopsy. So if they need an MRI or they're contemplating surgery, they've gotta wait two months anyway. So that's a lot of time in which to get second, third, fourth opinions. Right. I agree with you, it's more important to be confident with the decision than to rush into it. These are very slow growing tumors, so there's no fire.